Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Please be seated. It's the last weekend of the Easter season, and so we celebrate that. We also celebrate Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you who celebrate. And we also dig into God's Word. This is one of the things that I think mothers can be known for, those who are, are nurturing and encourage us to follow Jesus. And that's a faithful thing. We're diving into the book of James on our whistle stop tour through the books of the Bible. I always want our ears to be open and listening for what God has to tell us because it's not just him talking in this space, but he speaks in our, our regular life as well. He wants us to be attentive to what he's trying to tell us. And certainly we hear it here when we, we examine God's word. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I ask these couple questions, not just for this place, but also for you to read these books for yourself. Why do we read the Bible? And I pray you hear his voice today for you. What does his voice do? So we find these two things going hand in hand. We'll talk about that a little bit today. Another couple questions I like to ask are, what is God trying to tell me and what does he want me to do with it? How do I, I manage that? I, God wants me to hear from him, but he doesn't want me to say, okay, now that I've heard, that's nice, I've heard. What, I, what am I going to do with that? I, he doesn't want me to stay stock still. He wants me to move and walk with him. And so as we examine the book of James, this will certainly come into play. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present, that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. So I'd like to start out today with, with a fun little game, little question game, shall we? Here's the question. What are two things that go together? When you hear them said, they always kind of roll off the tongue in the same breath. I'll give you an example. If we're going to go with Forrest Gump, who's one of my favorites. Forrest Gump and Jenny, right? They were always together. Me and Jenny were like peas and carrots, right? So you hear peas and carrots, like, oh, okay, those two things go together. Something else. I'm, I'm asking you, what, what are a couple things that go together? Peanut butter and jelly. Okay, we had this last night. There's a, there's a food thing. Macaroni and cheese. Okay, what else? Salt and pepper. Can we get off the culinary kick here? What are some other things? Peace and... Oh, okay, I was thinking peace and quiet. What else? Tricks and treats. Yeah. Rock and roll. Yeah, okay, now we're cooking. Something else? One more? Day and night. Day and night. Yeah? How about uh, Old Blue Eyes? What would, what would Sinatra say? Love and marriage, love and marriage. Here's another one. Go together like a... That was told by mother. You can't have one without the other. There you go. Okay. I I'm glad you know that song. Otherwise, I would have to compete with Sinatra. Nobody wants to do that. But you get the point here? Some in our day and age would try to separate those two things, love and marriage, right? But really, there's, a, there's one thing to say, I love you. There's another thing to get down on one knee and then look someone in the eye in public and say, this is it. We're in it together, I promise you, always and forever. Two different things, but they go always together. That commitment is part of the love. And I think if, if we're looking at James, there's these two th concepts that he pairs inextricably together. They always have to be faith and works. You can't have one without the other. So that's where we start with the book of James. And I think that's going to speak to us a little bit about what it means to not just hear from God, but also to walk with him. A little bit of background on the book of James. This is one of what we call one of the general epistles. It was written around AD 50, and it was written to all Christians. So the, 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 the books of the New Testament, before they were collected, were often circulated amongst churches. And uh, this specific one was written by James. Now, very much in the same way that there are a multi multiplicity of Marys in the New Testament. You have like, which Mary are we talking about, right? Is it Mary, uh, the, the mother of Jesus? Is it one of the other Marys, Mary Magdalene? There's all sorts of Marys. Which one are we talking about? James is kind of the same way. And we actually heard two of them mentioned in the, the first reading for today, the, the list of the apostles. There's two Jameses. James, the brother of John, 
John and James, the son of Alphaeus. And the James we're going to talk about today actually slipped in there as well, because we're actually talking about Jesus' half-brother. We know that, that Jesus was born by the power of the Father through Mary, but J Mary and Joseph also had biological children, had a family of their own, Jesus' half-brothers and sisters. And of course, as far as they knew, they were just his, he was just their brother. How would they have necessarily known? Except that there have been tip-offs, right? Jesus, he's always doing everything right. To live in that family, to live up to that oldest, that would have been complicated. But James was one of Jesus' siblings, lived, grew up in his household. And much like the rest of Jesus' family, they had, he had a hard time at first believing that his older brother could be the Messiah. And for a while there, he and the rest of his family tried to rock Jesus off this, this Messiah dream that you have. You're kind of crazy. You're going out there and doing stuff that doesn't necessarily make sense to us. All that said, when all of a sudden done, he did, did come back to the, the place where he could see Jesus as the Messiah, became a missionary, and then later on became what we would know as the first bishop, the first church leader in Jerusalem. So this is James of Jerusalem, and he has this, this perspective that he wants to share with all of God's people everywhere. Now, this has kind of famously been known um, to be given the designation by Luther as the Epistle of Strength. Raw. And there's some context to that. Uh, Luther, did, during his day, had to fight very hard against this idea, this Roman Catholic idea that he grew up with, that if you do enough good things, then God will love you. Now, you and all, I both know that that's not how love works. We don't love someone or, or give and receive love because of what they do for us. Love is given freely, and that's how the Father handles us. He gave his son freely. He gives us our identity freely. Now, what do we want to do with that? But the Roman Catholic Church had a different idea, and it became abusive. So Luther pushed back hard on this idea of works, because it had been so distorted. So at the beginning of his career, he saw the, the gospel or the, the epistle of James as the epistle of straw. Now, there's a second part of this. Later on in his career, he was clear to know that that straw is a good thing. Because what do you have to have to run a farm? You have to have straw. So it's important, but it's of lesser value than some of the other books. Specifically because it has so many of these imperatives. You should do this. You should do this. You should do this. And to the Roman Catholic ear of his time would have heard, oh, so those are the things I do and then God loves me. Luther goes, no, it's faith alone. That's where we stake our claim. And then we learn what it's like to walk with Jesus. And so we're going to dive in a little bit to James 2. That gives us a little bit of an idea of what this dynamic between faith and works is all about. Uh, one of the other reasons why Luther was kind of cautious about James is because it really doesn't proclaim Christ crucified very clearly. But what it said, what we do after we know how much God has loved us through Christ, it certainly does say something about that. So here's James 2. Uh, James says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? Does that kind of faith that's without works save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is that? It rings hollow. In the same way, faith, if it is not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith, your faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You can say that, and you can have that assent. Good, I'm glad you're doing that. Even the demons believe that God is one, and they shudder, because it's more than just knowing in the head. Senseless person, he's not holding back at all, is he? Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You hear the call back to the story of Abraham? Abraham had faith and trust in God, but his faith was tested because God asked him to sacrifice to him the one thing that mattered to him, his son Isaac, the son of the promise. And so Abraham goes up intent to do that, and God sees his faith through his actions. You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. 
And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? Call back to the, the, the time right before Jericho. One of the, the, um, the oh, one of the, one of the ancestors of Jesus himself. Uh, Rahab, who was a prostitute in Jericho at the time and helped the spies out, she didn't say, oh, you guys are, are on the right side. We're, I'm going to be staying with God here and then hand them over to the rulers in Jericho. No, she hid them and helped them. She put action to her words. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. These things go together. You can't have one without the other. You can't say that you love and follow Jesus and then stay right where you are. Now, I know this is, is confusing, but it's like it's two sides of the same coin. If we say we believe something, then we're called to act on it. And I think, you know, for Luther, this was something that he wrestled with, especially with this letter. But I think he says it beautifully in this quote. We are saved by faith alone. There's one of the solas, right? Those are one of our Lutheran distinctives. By faith alone. Uh, But the faith that saves is never alone. I know that that's something that we'll have to wrestle with in our entire lives. I say I believe. Now what does my life look like because of that belief? And this is where Luther stood. And I think anybody who looked at the faith of Luther could see in his outward expressions the evidence of that faith, which is what this is really about. Let me give you another example. When Jesus inaugurated his ministry, Mark tells us that he gave us his purpose statement or his, his, uh, his mission statement, if you will, right? And this is what it sounds like. The time is fulfilled. It's go time, people. And the kingdom of God has come near. Certainly all the kingdom was embodied in Jesus. So here's what's going to happen. I want you to repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe. These two things go together. Now, let's examine those words. Repent doesn't always mean you've been bad and now you better stop. Sometimes it certainly means that. If you're going pell-mell away from God, then he wants you to turn your heart back to him. It might be doing a 180. That repentance looks like aiming at God and not our own desires. Sometimes, though, it's a slight course correction than a full 180. But that's what repenting is all about. When we trust God, when we have faith in God that he can point us in the right direction, then we're going to reorient ourselves. Now, believing is not just, I understand with my head what God is saying, and in my heart, I want to trust God. It's actually putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak. It's putting our faith into action, doing something with it. So that believing part is more like uh, walking with God, actually putting one foot in front of the other. These two questions, what is God trying to tell me? How is he trying to change my heart? And then what do I want to do with it? What does he want me to do with it? Is walking with him, putting that action to the faith that we profess. Here's another way of thinking about it. If I want to walk out of this building right now, out of this room right now, and I'm oriented that way, do you think that's going to work very well? What's going to happen if I start walking? I'm going to start hitting that pew and probably fall in Dan's lap, and that's not going to be good for either of us. Okay? So what I got to do first? I have to change my direction, my trajectory. So I do this. I say, that's where the door is. Sometimes that's what repentance looks like. But have I moved at all? I haven't gone anywhere. I'm not any closer to the door now. I know where I'm supposed to go, but I haven't started walking. What does God want me to do? He wants me to go that way. Okay, I know where I'm going now. What does he want me to do with it? He wants me to put one step in front of the other. This is what faith looks like. This is what faith sounds like. This is what faith looks like. He wants me to walk with him. Not stay right where I am, but go where he calls. So faith and works go together. Those two questions go together. What is God telling me? What does he want me to do with it? I think that's a a helpful way of, of approaching God and not just assenting with our heads or with our hearts that we believe, but then actually doing something about it. So here's, here's the couple things that I'm picking up that I think are helpful for us. Faith is best expressed through action. Some people in our culture will say, well, faith, it's a very personal thing. It's something that I keep to myself. 
And I understand that to a certain degree. There are too many people who have been peacocking about their faith throughout history. And we go, man, that's, that's not the best look. But you know that there are plenty of people who have expressed their faith in humble and beautiful ways, in everyday ways, that are admirable. And that's the kind of faith that we should have. That expression of action, not just something privately, internally, but something that is shown out externally. So the question for all of us is, how is God calling you to live this week as an expression of his love? I know I've been loved deeply. Jesus went to the cross to show that. That was his amazing external expression of God's love. Now, how can I be like him, give my life away piece by piece to those around me? Because the amazing thing about God's love, it never gives out. There's always more. And so we never lose anything by giving what God gives us in abundance. So can we do one more pair of things that go together? How about mothers? Mothers and... Okay. See, we had this conversation last night as well. Mothers and fathers go together, and yes, this is true, but mothers and children go together too, right? To be a mother, you kind of have to have children. And, And so we celebrate mothers and other women in our lives who have nurtured us and have had that role. There are many different ways of going about that and and celebrating that. But I know that for some people, uh, Mother's Day is a complicated thing. It's not always the joyful celebration that it's meant to be. And it's because people are complicated and sin does a pretty good job of breaking just about everything it touches, including relationships. So whether it's discord or distance or even death that have separated people, You know, sometimes Mother's Day has a sharp barb for some of us, and that's not always an easy thing to deal with. But for those of us who have known great mothers, other amazing nurturing women in our lives, I think we know that when they say, I love you, they mean it for the most part. We can can certainly understand that. But on top of that, or beside that, there's a mountain of evidence, a million and one ways where they have shown us by their actions that those words mean something. They've loved us by action. I think that's a great expression of of what this whole uh, faith and works thing is about. Our parents tell us they love us, and then they do something about it. Now, mothers are also pretty good at showing us which way to go and pointing us the right direction. Whether we go that way is a whole different thing, right? And I think God deals with us the same way. He says, this is the direction I want you to go. Not that way, this way. And sometimes we have a hard time figuring out where he's directing us, and sometimes we have a hard time putting one foot in front of the other. And for all of us who have struggled to walk with God, even though we know what he's saying, I have some good news. Even in the moments where we feel weak to walk with God, we have a God who is always faithful to us, who walks the road in front of us, behind us, who went to the cross and stayed there to express his love. And I think that's something we should emulate. I think that's something that we should take the cues from Jesus and follow him. Go where he leads us. Because when Jesus is leading us, we always end up in a good place. Amen? Yes? Please pray with me. (coughs) Father God, we thank and praise you that you have given us examples in people around us, mothers especially, of people who have put their their love into action around us. We pray that our faith would not be alone, but it would be accompanied by expressions of your love wherever we go. That when people see us, they see a picture of who you are. It is a high and holy thing, and it is something that we cannot accomplish alone. So fill us with your spirit, so that we can love like Jesus, and that the world would know that we belong to you, in your family, and with you forever. In your name we pray, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts, your minds, always in Christ Jesus, our Lord, the one who lived and died for you. Amen.